John chapter 15, verse 11, one verse. This is Jesus speaking. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Father, we know that the resurrection, you raising from the dead, Lord Jesus, it's all about joy. It's all about embracing the joy of a resurrected life, of joining our life to you, Lord, so that the fulfillment of this, of this verse can be realized in our life where it says that your joy can be our joy that our joy may be full, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, we know that it blesses you, it delights you to see your children, your saints rejoicing in you. Oh Lord, please, that I wouldn't be a hindrance to that happening this morning. You say everyone who is called by my name I have created to give to me. Lord, do that work in us this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. You may be seated. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Easter, whatever the world has made it, and the Bible says this is what it's all about. The, the Christian community, the body of Christ in the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what Easter is all about. So here in John 15, verse 11, Jesus speaks these words just a few hours before he was arrested and to be sentenced to death and crucified, verse 11. Speaking to his dad. I have spoken to you that my joy remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Most translations uh, put it like this. This is the English Standard Version, but probably 80% of the translations phrase, it, phrase Jesus' words like this. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So how is it? Again, Jesus has told the disciples, he spent a lot of time on this, in John chapter 14, he's, he's told his disciples that he's going to be leaving, and where he's going, they cannot follow, at least for now. How is it that the disciples are going to be able to have the joy of Jesus if he is leaving? <laughs> now, I have, uh, you know, you, I'm sure, have known, I've known a, a number of people, many people over the years, who are just joyful, happy people. When you are around them, they make you feel happy. I am so glad over the years we've had many folks from Nigeria in our church because they are happy people. And if you know Nigerians, you know what I mean. I, I like hanging around these folks. I like them. I love them uh, to just to be around them uh, because they make you happy just being around them. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that the disciples were joyful and happy being around Jesus because though Jesus is called a man of sorrows, more on that later as to why, He knew great sorrow. The Bible teaches that no one rejoices more than God and the Son of God. 
Consider this, Psalm 60. God has spoken, in his holiness I will rejoice. Get out of your mind that idea that holiness involves no laughter, no joy. It's exactly the opposite. I have heard a couple times just in the last year on major ministries that I respect, teachers that I respect, or ministries of teachers that I respect, say God cares more about your holiness than your happiness. That is nonsense. (laughs) This is what holiness is. I will rejoice, says the Lord. Holiness means the separateness of God. The uniqueness of God. He he is joyful in a way no one else is. (laughs) Just like he is pure in the way no one else is. Just as in the way that he is just in the way that no one else is, he rejoices in the way, in a way that no one else can. Jesus was filled with joy. I have no doubt in my mind that just being around him physically filled them with joy continuously because Jesus, the Bible says, the Son of God, was filled with joy. And again, verse 11 says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be. Full or abundant is what it's saying. But how is it if he's leaving that, that the disciples are going to be able to have that joy of Jesus? I, I don't know about you, but you know, when, a, when I'm hanging around, a, a person's really happy. Uh, they hang around, I hang out with me. You know, for a while, they, they leave. Man, that happiness just it stuck with me. And it's a cool thing. It hangs out with me for a while, but you know, after a couple hours... I'm on to other stuff and uh, not quite as happy anymore. Okay? You know, or, or maybe if they're, they're super duper mega moga happy, maybe even a, a few days. That, that, but then, it, then the happiness sort of, sort of wears off, right? But, so Jesus, how are you going to be able, how am I going to be able to have your joy, the disciples are, are, are wondering, no doubt, if you're leaving, The answer is the resurrection. That's the answer. The resurrection, what today, Easter, is all about, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen, no resurrection, no abundance of joy for the child of God. Now turn with me to the right in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Please turn with me. This is the 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. It could be called the famous resurrection chapter. It's all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to go here today. I have in the past. But there is an enormous amount of material out there with the internet. You, can, you have close access to it of how well documented the resurrection of Jesus is. The resurrection of Jesus. And someone may say, the resurrection from the dead. That defies natural law. How, is, how, how am I supposed to believe something that goes against natural law? To which I say, well, look around you. Where did all this come from? Did it just come from nothing? Uh, apply your natural law to that. I think of that famous interview with uh, Richard Dawkins, the most famous evolutionary biologist in the world. He's, he carries the flag, the banner. And they interviewed him. And, and the interviewer said, well, Richard, where did life come from? Where? And he says, well, we really don't know. And I said, but, and the interviewer said, well, where did it come from? And, and he said, well, I'll tell you where I think it came from. I believe aliens planted life on planet Earth. This is the smartest man scientist in the world? That's science fiction. That's not science. 
It came by a creator who defied natural law and spoke and created. And, and so here in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the famous resurrection uh, chapter, it, it goes over the eyewitness account, verse 3, the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, I deliver to you first of all that which I have received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. And after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep. Referring to this fact that some have died but most are alive. Verse 7, after that he was seen by James, then by the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. I'll skip down to verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he has been uh, raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if you have a pen or pencil, underline verse 17, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. I like the New English translation. It translates translate this verse like this. Um, ah, there we have it. Thank you. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. It's powerless. You are still in your Sins. You're still under the penalty of your sins. The penalty for sin is death. You're, you're still under the, the, the power of your sin. Oh man, is sin a control freak? It will control you. And, and, and you are still under the misery of your sins. No re resurrection. No fullness of joy. No resurrection, no joy. But with the resurrection... There is the promise of the fullness of joy. How is that? Because after Jesus rose from the dead and he was taken to heaven, as we have been reading the last couple chapters, what happened? He sent the Holy Spirit and by th and through the Holy Spirit, Jesus and his joy comes into any man, woman, or child who receives him as the crucified, risen king. Jesus says this to his disciples. He says to them, referring to his resurrection. He says, after I'm taken away, John 14, verse 16 and 17, after I'm taken away, do we have that? I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, the Spirit of truth. He, he <laughs> will be in you. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And I in you. And I can't help but also quote one of my favorite verses in the Bible, John 7. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he, Jesus, spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would, would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet 
glorified, re referring to his resurrection and being taken up into heaven. No resurrection, no abundance of joy. With the resurrection, a fullness of joy. So back to the verse, our verse this morning, John chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus says, again, hours before his arrest and his crucifixion, he says to them, he says to you, these things I speak to you, I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So how is it that the disciples will be able to have the joy of Jesus even if he's leaving? Because the resurrection. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Easter is all about. Okay. Now, let's switch gears. Let us switch gears. I want to talk about what joy is made up of. Actually, just one piece of that. If you have received the crucified and risen Son of God in your, as your Lord and King, and therefore by definition have become a child of God, remember John chapter 1, verse 12, to whoever believes in Jesus, whoever has received him, he gives the right to become a child of God. If you're a child of God, your joy must begin... with this one thing. Accepting the forgiveness of God. That's foundational to joy. Oh man, have I seen, a, as, as the years accumulate in a man or woman's life, and the record of sin grows larger and larger, just the shame, the guilt, the lack of joy because of a lack, or rather a refusal to accept the forgiveness of God. The forgive, accepting the forgiveness of God, foundational to having joy. You know, there's a couple things that I did in my youth prior to walking with God which periodically when I try to pray there's a voice and the voice says you can't pray to God remember that thing oh yes I do remember that. you can't be fruitful for God Pastor Steve Remember that thing that you did. You can't expect God to bless that your life. Remember that thing. You can't worship God freely. You can't sing. You can't talk about God to others. You can't thrive in your, in your life with God. That thing in your life, it's, it's too ugly. It's too bad, too big. How can a child of God have joy with a voice resounding like that? It's impossible. It's not going to happen. But by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, by faith, that voice, that alarmometer that goes, eh, 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 anytime you begin to pray or experience joy or victory in your life, it goes away by the resurrection. It's defeated, it's destroyed. And let me explain. Remember that last, the last verse in 1 Corinthians 15 that we read. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is useless, it's powerless, and you're still in your sins. Your faith is useless, it's powerless, and you're still in your sin. But listen, with the resurrection, you have, been, uh, you have the, the life of Jesus Christ, the power of Christ, by the Holy Spirit who lives in you, your faith is no longer useless. It's no longer powerless. 
1 Corinthians 15, 17. Um, it, rather, it, it's by faith you can accept the forgiveness of God that he promises to anyone and everyone who has put their trust in the crucified and risen Savior. Another verse I love. And this is one of the promises of forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering, what's that referring to? Shout it out, someone. The crucifixion. For by one offering, Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain, offered on the cross, he has perfected. That means you, child of God. Those who are being sanctified, those who, are, who God is putting apart for his work, Brother, sister, you have been given the gift of faith because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that gift of, of, of faith is brought to life in such a way that you can embrace this promise, this fact. Actually, this isn't a, a promise for the future. This is a present reality for by one offering he is perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Okay. So you say, I get what you're saying, Pastor Steve. But I've tried that and it doesn't work. Okay, I've been there. Let's do this then. Let us do this. I'm going to read, you don't have to go there with me. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 14 and 15. Which, speaking of eyewitness, eyewitness accounts, this is eyewitness account of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Starting with his arrest, verse 43 of Mark chapter 14, and immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now, his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one seize him and lead him away safely. Now, as soon as he had come... Immediately he went up to Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him, and they took him. Verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Middle of verse 61. The high priest asked Jesus, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus responded, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Verse 65, then some began to spit on him. to blindfold him and to beat him and say to him, prophesy, prophesy to us. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Chapter 15, immediately in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and they bound Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, it is as you say. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so the Roman governor, Pilate, marveled. 
Now at the feast, referring to the Passover, he was accustomed by it to release one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. So each year the Roman governor released one prisoner to the Jews, as sort of being a part of goodwill, part of the Passover feast. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude crying aloud began to ask Pilate to do just as he has always done for them. But Pilate answered saying, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Verse 11 says, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them and Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And so they cried out again and said, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after him to be scourged, whipped. Now, Jewish law, Old Testament law, had a requirement that no one could be scourged, whipped, more than 40 times. The Romans were not bound by that. The Romans scourged Jesus. If you've ever seen The Passion of Christ, I believe it's an accurate biblical description of Jesus scourging. His, his, his back would have been opened up completely his flesh opened up by the time he was placed on the cross. In fact, there are accounts of people just dying from the scourging. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Bar Bar Barabbas to them and scourged Jesus uh, to be crucified. Then the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, verse 16 led him away to a hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head. And they be began to salute him, to, to mock him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck his head with a reed and, and spat on him. And bowing to the knee, they worshipped him, and they mocked him, and they took the purple off him. They put on his, his own clothes and led him out to crucify him. Verse 25. Now it was the third hour, that would be 9 a.m., and they crucified him. They drove an iron stake through his right hand, an iron stake through his left, and an iron stake through both of his feet. Crucifixion was such a gruesome torture that it was illegal to crucify a Roman citizen. They didn't die by excessive bleeding. They died usually by asphyxiation. They, they couldn't breathe anymore because a crucified man slumped down and as a result was unable to breathe so they had to lift themselves up on this iron stake with their feet in order to survive. That's why they broke the legs of the, the, the uh, thieves on his right and his left in order to expedite their death. It was the third hour and they crucified him. Verse 26, and the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. Verse 27, with him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests, also mocking among themselves with a scribe, said, He saved others himself. He cannot save. Let the Messiah, the King of the Jews, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were were crucified with him, reviled him. 
Verse 33, now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge filled with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered to him to drink. And the others say, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. Verse 37, it says, then Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. He was naked, by the way. They the Roman soldiers under the cross gambled away his inner garments. His outer garments had been taken off. Why is such a horrific, shameful, ugly scene included in the Bible? So that you can read and understand that however horrific, shameful, and ugly your sin is, it was not as horrific and shameful and ugly, not even a small fraction, not even a tiny grain of sand of horrific, shameful, and ugly that occurred at the cross. The ugly, the horrific, the shameful, horrific cross inflicted on the perfect, matchless, spotless Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Are you, sinner, going to overrule God's choice that your sin, your shame, your guilt, that nagging voice of guilt is taken away, it's cast out forever because Jesus' ugliness, that horrific crime on the cross where he paid for the ugliness of your sin. Are you going to overrule what God has chosen? What he has chosen, that, that your guilt is done away with because of the uh, guilt on the cross, that the cross is such a beautiful, it's a, such an ugly but beautiful scene because our guilt, our shame, we have no more because of what was done. Are you going to do that? Are you going to not embrace that promise in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14? By one offering the cross, he is perfected forever. Are you going to insist on wallowing in your, uh, your guilt, hearing, listening, acting on that voice, that alarm bell that says, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Remember that ugly thing. Remember that horrific thing. Remember that shameful thing. What about what happened to them that you inflicted that on? God has chosen a way of joy. In fact, Jesus Christ, when you do that, when you do that, when you refuse to place your guilt and shame at the foot of that horrific, ugly scene, the cross, you grieve, meaning you sorrow, the very heart of God. He grieves because of it. He weeps because of that, when you and I do that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, says this of Jesus, it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Sinner, and I speak this to my own sinful heart, and I, am I going to rob Jesus of the joy of seeing me rejoice because of what happened at the cross? Am I going to do that? Now, back to the resurrection. Back to our verse that we started with, John chapter 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, 
and that your joy may be full. My joy may be because of the resurrection. Your faith is not powerful. It's been brought alive, and you are not still under the power of your sin, under the power of that voice, because of the resurrection, because Christ, who lives in you, that is the joy of the resurrection. That's why we rejoice on Easter. I'm going to call the worship team up at this time. And we're going to have communion. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, before you have communion, examine yourself. Examine yourself. So let's apply that to the message today. I want you to examine yourself as the worship team begins to play, and I want you to, uh, to consider, have I been listening to that voice? That voice that says, you can't pray, you can't have joy, you can't be fruitful, you can't minister for God. If so, I'd like you to do business with the Lord now. Actually, if you have been asked to pray, please come up at this time. If you'd like someone to pray you through that, if you'd like someone to pray you through that, I have been there so many times where the enemy of my soul or my flesh is trying to rob me of the joy of that promise, the fulfillment of this promise, where Jesus says in John 15, verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. If you need to work through that, I'd like you to do that before you have communion, not after. And the reason is, is because communion, the cup represents the blood of Christ, the blood by which your sin has been forgiven, the broken body represents the bread, that body that was scourged, or rather the, broken, the, the, the bread represents the broken body, the body that was scourged, it was the back that was laid open for you. And those things were done. Jesus went through that ugly, horrific, shameful scene so that your joy could be full, so you could accurately represent God to the world, God who rejoices more than anybody. <laughs> So let's do that with communion. Let's do that. As the worship team uh, just begins now, let's, let's worship. Thank God for the cross, the resurrection. And if you'd like to pray, please come up. I'll be up here. You can come pray with me or some of the others.